Today, I'm talking with one of the all-time great coaches in the history of women's basketball, Muffet McGraw. Obviously, Muffet has been in the news the past couple of weeks due to some back and forth comments with Gino Ariema. We talked about their beef in this discussion, but I wanted to give some context to when the conversation happened and what I think about it now. I spoke with Muffet at the end of December. This was in the middle of the back and forth with Gino. So you'll notice we don't address some of the later comments that were made. Here's what I currently think about the issue. I think the, the Muffet Gino beef was given the, the time and space that was needed to for discussion. Um, they are people who have been in our game for a very long time. They were they were competitors. So so they know. I mean, they know they have history in our game. And when the historians of our game speak, we give them a space. Uh, to talk, um, to banter, to discuss colorfully. I think when when Muffet and, and Gino speak, it's, it's always good for the sport. And I, I'll say this, they they have a, a relationship, whether it be um, a competitive relationship. So uh, I don't mind them uh, disagreeing on a topic, but here's what happens. We have other people who only cover our, our game when it when they think something negative is, is occurring by some of our great, 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 great coaches. I love it because the people who really uh, follow our sport, they get to have a different type of conversation. They get to choose sides as to who they think is right, who they think is wrong. And when you're discussing our game, Take us for who we are, because it's not just no sport. No sport is just going to be, um, you know, hunky dory great. You're going to we're human beings. There are going to be things that are that are said and done that you know, some people will, you know, wholeheartedly disagree or agree. And I, I think it's great for discussion of the people who really uh, follow our sport. If Muffet said there's media bias, I, I'm going to believe Muffet because she's been in our game a long time. Um, I mean, you see it. I'm in the game. I, I, you see what's happening um, out there in our sport. Um, there is. Uh, and I, at the same time, um, is, is biased towards a, a program and a coach that um, they've been successful. Like, I mean, they, you know, they, when you think about women's basketball, you think about Connecticut not just because of their their national championships and the fact that uh they reign supreme in our in our sport for a very long time but also um the media uh, the the ESPNs the um you know the the Twitter handles the social media handles of ESPN they decide um who they want to put in the forefront and most times uh, probably 90%, 99% of the time is UConn um, because of, of their greatness. Um, but I would say there's room for that area to grow. There is a lot of room for that area to grow because at some point, UConn's not going to be um, reigning supreme on our sport. So we have to get ready to, to, to share that space that's going to be vacated uh, I'm sure in the, you know, in the future. I mean, Gino's influence on the sport is, is I, I don't think is overrated uh, because of uh, what he's built, because of the championship that he has to back it. Um, I, and I, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to say this. Their program really doesn't look like any other program around the country because of their greatness. Now you have, and I'm going to be a little biased, South Carolina bias, um, you, you have a program like our program who probably looks like most of programs across the country, meaning um, we, 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 we build it from a, the ground up in the midst of UConn's greatness. And everybody, everybody, you know, wants to dethrone UConn. 
and everybody that wants UConn dethroned um, will rally around a program like our program. And, um, and they create a space for us to, to honestly be great while we're great. You know, I think we're at a place in our in the history of women's basketball where you're seeing a, a, a different team step into that spotlight um, that that was only was only given to to UConn. So um, I think we need to really appreciate what UConn and Gino have done for the history of women's basketball, but also sharing a space in which um sharing a space in which there are other great teams that, that that's coming out of the ballpark that that challenge that and and some people like that and some people don't um so I think we have to take it as it is I think hey, we need to look at it like those, those great teams out there that have been doing some some great things over the years like UConn need to be commended for for that as well as the other teams need to be commended um, and that space should be shared um, because there's room for everybody, for everybody to eat, as they say, these young kids say, is there room for everybody to eat in our sport? And when, when we're able to share in that space, when something good happen, happens in our, in our game, it, it feels good. The Beijing Olympics are finally here. While you watch as athletes compete, hear their stories. Listen to top women athletes share their trials and triumphs on the Flame Bears podcast. Stay tuned for more and what's ahead on Flame Bears season two. What's the best workout program? The one that is custom built just for you. Future is the new workout experience that pairs you one-on-one with your own fitness coach. Your coach will map out a plan based on your goals with workouts delivered to your phone each week. Future, your Apple Watch, and the app all pair seamlessly so you and your coach can track your progress, celebrate achievements, and keep you accountable every day. Get started right now with 50% off your first three months at tryfuture.com slash netlife. I'm excited, super excited to welcome Muffet McGraw to the podcast, Coach McGraw has two NCAA titles, was a four-time AP Coach of the Year, a three-time Naismith Coach of the Year, and was the 2017 John Wooden Legends of Coaching Award winner. And she was also inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame. As a head coach of Notre Dame, she led the Irish to 26 NCAA tournament appearances, including seven championship game appearances. Muffet retired in 2020 with 936 career victories and a 76.2 winning percentage. Muffet, thank you so much for joining NetLife. It's great to have you. Thanks, Dawn. I'm excited to be here and excited about this conversation. <laughs> I'm, I'm super excited, too. So we're, we're going to talk about a lot of different topics, but um, I always like to, to talk about um, in the beginning, like, 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 when did you fall in love with basketball? Well, I played basketball. And of course, my age, uh, we just started playing basketball. When I went to St. Joe's in Philly, that was the first year we had a team. And, you know, part-time coaches, we did our own laundry, we bought our own shoes, drove ourselves to the games. And, you know, we played for, for just love of the game. There were no scholarships. There really wasn't anything. And a lot of playground basketball, same as you, you know, down at the playground, me and nine guys. And I just, I did, I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. So when I graduated from St. Joe's, I thought, gosh, what am I going to do now? You know, how can I stay in the game? And a uh, coaching job opened at Archbishop Carroll. And from my first practice, I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. <laughs> So it's a, it's amazing how uh, um, when you, when you're passionate about something, you you know a lot of times people can't walk into their passion, but you knew what you wanted to do from the from the very beginning, and you you've certainly uh, made your mark in our in our game. Um, I know Saint, you got your start at St. Joe's. They call it St. Joseph's now. 
I think we oh, got to say the whole. Yeah, they, they don't even say. <laughs> <laughs> they they changed that a couple of years ago, where uh, you know all the Philly people are used to saying St. Joe's, and now yeah. it's uh, you got to say the the entire St. Joseph's. I um, must have missed that alumni letter. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> <laughs> so when when you look at the growth of women's basketball from when you were in college to now, um, there's clearly a lot of change. What, what's been the biggest change and what's the next step in the evolution of, uh, of our game? Well, I think Title IX gave us opportunity, but what we've gotten is we've come so far in terms of scholarships and, and that kind of opportunity financially for women. I think in terms of coaching, the salaries have really improved, which kind of the unconscious uh, part of that was that we got a lot more men in our game you know, because the salaries were good enough and we got what men got and we, that's what we wanted. And then we saw that women were starting to be held accountable. Uh, they were getting fired from their jobs. You know, we went from 90% of women coaches back in the seventies when title nine came out and now we have 40%. So we've gone backwards in some ways, but what we've gotten, I mean, the attention that we've gotten, you go to the final four and it's a sellout and you, you're especially at South Carolina with the crowds that you're getting. I mean, it's just so great to see that. When I was in college, my, my coach used to joke that she would recruit players from big families so we'd get a little <laughs> bigger crowd. And, uh, you know, I could always count the number of people in the gym when I started, even at Notre Dame when we started. Uh, we really had to build it up. So I, I think that fan base, uh, you know, I, I think we've gotten a lot more attention. The SEC network, the ACC network, ESPN is covering us a little bit better. We've got a lot more games on TV. So I, I think it's it's been a lot of positives. That's great. That's the sure is. Um, we're going to get back to some of the other topics that you mentioned in that in that answer. But you're only one of five coaches in, in women's or men's basketball division one history with over 930 wins nine final four appearances and multiple NCAA championships. It's you, it's Pat Summit, it's Gino, it's Tara, and it's Coach K. When you look back over your career now, what do you think separated you? What was the difference between being a good coach and a great coach? But, you know, besides the winning, because the winning speaks for itself. Well, it's all about the players, uh, as you know, and recruiting, as you know, when, when you get better players, somehow you look a little bit better. You know? <laughs> and I always say, like, I hope you guys can make up for all the mistakes I'm making. Uh, but you, it, it's about the fit, too. It's not about just getting the best players in the country. It's about kids that fit into what you want to do, um, what I wanted to do at Notre Dame, the culture that we created. You know, certain kids fit better than others. And it's not just about talent. I mean, it's about chemistry. It's about being unselfish. How are you going to get along? But for me, I think one of the big reasons uh, I'm in coaching or I wasn't coaching was about empowering women. I mean, we, we just, we can do so much more for women. We can show them role models. We can show them what leadership looks like for women. And, and I think that that's really important. So I, I think a lot of the women that came to Notre Dame, and I was the first female coach they had. So a lot of them came uh, because they wanted to grow as women and to do a little bit more and to find their voice and to gain that confidence. Yep. So I, I mean, I used to see you on a recruiting trail. I mean, you, you kept to yourself. You knew what you were looking for in a, you know, uh, in a recruit. Like, what is it like? I, I watched you doing the, you know, on the on the trail. I would just look and see. Mm -hmm. um, um, you you're sitting there, you're watching, and I'm like, okay, well, you know, I'm at I'm at the same court, and I know we recruited some of the same people, mm -hmm. but but what is it about? Uh, like, what what was a a Notre Dame type prospect? What do they look like for you? Well, I think, first of all, I love to see them in a losing game or a really close game because I want to see how they handle when the ref makes a bad call against them. Uh, I want to see how when they throw a great pass to a teammate who misses a wide open layup. I want to see when the coach yells at them or, or puts them on the bench or is talking to them, like, are they making eye contact? So I want to see how the team treats them in terms of, are they a leader? I know you're going to be the best player on the floor, but how is your team looking at you? You know, are, are they trying to get you the ball in clutch situations or or, you know, is, is there some jealousy? Are you rolling your eyes when they make mistakes or are you encouraging them? So first thing I look for is that kind of leadership. 
The second thing is their work ethic, because I don't think you can teach that. I, I think kids, either they work hard or they don't. You know, and, and so when I see somebody, I don't care if they're up 20 or down 20, they should be playing just as hard in mm -hmm. every game. And I think that's important. And probably the, the biggest thing is unselfish. You have to be unselfish. You have to have team first. And I think that, you know, all the players that we both have, you know, they, they were all the leading scorer in their team. You know, one of the leading scorers in the league, maybe even in the state. But it's more important to win. And that's what I wanted, that you could sacrifice some of those things in order to win. Because, um, you know, accountability is one of my core values. And like, like if you're not willing to say like, oh, that was my fault, we're not going to get along at all. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I love smart players, too. I mean, I love kids that can figure things out. You know, they can, you know, figure out the offense and, oh, we got out of the offense. Here's how we can get right back in. Or, hey, there's a mismatch there. I got to throw it in here. You know, just little things like that. But mm -hmm. those those are the main things. Yeah. So 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 tell me what the conversation is like that that player that you've been watching and you see they 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 aren't that 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 good teammate that you you know, you're, you're looking for. They they their body language, you know, their their response, they're, you know, they're not looking, uh, making eye contact with their coaches, but you, but there's something about them that you really like. You had conversation with them, but suddenly you see this type of behavior. Do you, do you have the conversation with them the next time you talk to them? And what would that conversation be like with them and their parents? Well, as a younger coach, I was like, she's good. We need her. Like she can really <laughs> help us win. And then as I got more experienced and, and wisdom of age, I looked for red flags. Like I looked for things like that. Um, I looked for how they treat their parents, how they're, you know, I'd have conversations with the parents and it'd be like, wow, you know, she's not the first girl to play basketball. Like she didn't invent the game. You know, <laughs> I, I think so. I like the parents that I really looked at that relationship. Are they looking at their parents in the stand when they're playing? Uh, are the parents the one calling me or like, I'm not coaching you. I'm coaching your daughter. So mm -hmm. a, a lot of times, honestly, we would drop them. I mean, I would just say, you know what? She's not going to fit in. I don't care how good she is. I want to enjoy my life. <laughs> you know, I, I want to have you for four years here and I want to enjoy that relationship. So uh, I don't want to have to really try to drag it out of you to get you to work hard and get you to be unselfish. You know, I, I can honestly say that I, I'm at that point in my coaching career where, you know, I, I have a really soft heart for, for young people that really haven't gotten it. You know, the single parent yeah. prospect um, over the years, like I've really just, I, I feel like if I can help them, they can help a mass of people when they go back to their neighborhoods. Now that, that was my thought very early on in my career and throughout my career. And then probably I would say over the past five to seven years that started to change. And then I, I sound more like you in that I, I look at that, that, that relationship with their parents. Like if they don't respect their parents, there's no way they're going to respect me nor our coaching staff. So, I, I really, I, I don't, I don't go there. Like that's a, that's a prerequisite for me in coaching now is that what kind of relationship do you have and respect that you have for your parents and, and your siblings? Cause that is a, you know, a indicator of who you are as a, as a person. And I'm, I'm with you at this stage in my career. I, I don't want to be the motivator. I don't, I don't want to be the one that is, is the chain mate change maker for it for them in that way, because I find that it takes too much time away from your team trying yeah. to get that player to that place. And, um, I guess, I guess it, it just comes, it comes with age. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, and, you figured it out a lot earlier yes. than I did, <laughs> but you know, you waste all your energy sometimes on one kid yes. and you think, what about the rest of them? These kids yes. that are working hard and doing their job, like they're not getting the attention they deserve. Yes, that's that. That's so true. That's so true. So let, let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, the you recently made some comments about ESPN being biased uh, towards UConn. Uh, both Candace Parker and Simone Augustus have commented this year about Gino's influence over Team USA's program. First off, can you can you just explain to our listeners who might not have heard what you meant by ESPN being biased towards UConn? Well, and it's not just ESPN, but I think there is a bias towards UConn. I, I think that it's, 
you know, it's easy. They're up in, you know, New England. And so they, you know, they're familiar with UConn. And I think they promote UConn a little bit more, well, actually a lot more than they promote other teams. I think in order for us to grow the game, we've got to hear more about your players. We, we need more more one-on-one interviews with your players. We need to talk about Stanford and, you know, some of the other teams that are out there. And I don't think we do that enough. So I think the casual fan of women's basketball only ever hears about UConn. And I, I agree with what happened with USA Basketball. I think Gino has a lot of say. Um, and this year I was so excited that we had two players because I didn't think Skylar Diggins would ever make the Olympic team. <laughs> um, and she, you know, obviously a dream come true for her a- along with Jules. So, you know, I, I think things changed a little bit with you as the coach, but there was a definite bias. I mean, there was an itinerary for the UConn players and there was an itinerary for the other players and, uh, they, they were treated differently if, if they did make the team. Um, but I think a lot of those player of the year things that are out, a lot of those lists, Connecticut has six players on those lists and you see what happened without Paige. Um, do they really have three national player of the years on their team? Do they have three player of the years in their position? Um, you know, I, I just think it's, it's a little bit lazy. People go, Oh, though she's at UConn. So let me put her on the list. Um, I don't think he, they make them earn it. And we have a chance to put people on at mid season. I really hate when they put freshmen on these teams. They haven't done anything yet. So don't put them on it. Now, add them at midseason. They, they could be, like Paige was last year, the best player in the country. But let them earn it first. We talked a little bit off camera about this. Um, and I'm excited to share more about Flame Bears. One of my new favorite podcasts on Flame Bears, top women Olympic and Paralympic athletes from around the world like USA Soccer's Becky Sauerbrunn and Nigerian hoop star Azene Kalu Phelps share their rarely heard stories and their full selves. Hear directly from the masters of grit and resilient to learn more about the issues that matter most to them and how they've been able to overcome obstacle after obstacle. Season two is live now and Flame Bearers is spotlighting the women athletes blazing a trail to Beijing including U.S. figure skater Brady Tennell, ROC's Oksana Abdekarmanmova, and many more. When you watch them compete in February and March, you'll see what they've worked so hard to achieve. But first, hear from them what happens when the cameras are off and stadiums are silent. During these challenging times, these women are an endless source of hope and inspiration. Watch the Winter Olympics going on in Beijing now and listen to Flame Bears wherever you get your podcasts. What's the best workout program? The one that is custom built just for you. Future is the new workout experience that pairs you one-on-one with your own fitness coach. You'll get unlimited personal training and all the support you need to stay on track. Your coach will map out a plan based on your goals, build the workouts to get you there, and keep you accountable every day. Future, your Apple Watch, and the app all pair seamlessly to allow you to track metrics like calories burned and heart rate. Together, you and your coach can track your progress, celebrate achievements, and tune your routine to perfection. Future has over 3,000 five-star reviews. It may be the most expensive fitness app in the store, but it's the lowest you'll pay for unlimited personal training. Workouts built just for you and the individual coaching to push your performance to the next level. That's the future of fitness. Get started right now with 50% off your first three months at tryfuture.com slash netlife. That's tryfuture.com slash netlife. Future provides unlimited digital training and custom workouts all through the future app. Get your first three months for 50% off. Have you ever heard of recovery footwear or active recovery? I had neither until a fellow coach gifted me a pair of UFOs. And let me tell you, they have become my habit. I keep a pair everywhere, at home, in my office, in my locker, everywhere. As a former athlete, I still work out. It's tough to turn that off, but I also have to get my boy Champ his exercise. And of course, coaching 
is super active. So I'm constantly on the move. My UFOs help me feel so much better throughout the day, no matter how much I have going on. UFOs uses a unique foam material called UFOM TM that absorbs impact so your body doesn't have to. You know, the journey that leads you to success is filled with adversity that can knock you off your path. But the resilience to sustain that success starts with active recovery and UFOs. Check out all the different styles, each with the same foam technology and footbed on UFOs.com. They changed my life and I think they could do the same for you. I feel like we need to have these conversations, even if it pisses some people off, we, we need to talk about these things. We need to have these uncomfortable conversations um, about our game because ultimately, ultimately, I would say 99% of the people want our game to grow. I didn't publicly speak out about what took place in our game back in 2020. I, I thought we were, you know, I thought we were the favorites to win during the pandemic year when the bottom fell out and the season ended. And I, I thought we spent not the last nine weeks of the season as a number one team in the country. And I let some of the decision makers in our sport know that you didn't cover our team enough. Like, and, and why? And they, they did tell me we were going to cover you in the tournament. Like sure. the bottom fell out. So the tournament isn't here. So, so why I was really pissed off and I probably pissed off a couple of people, but after, after that conversation, Honestly, 45 minutes after that conversation, I got a call actually from Carolyn Pecht saying that they they want to do an hour long documentary on our team. And I'm like, and I, I had this heated conversation with Carolyn Peck and I told her, I'm sorry, I know you're just you know, the messenger, but here's what I would like for what our game needs and to take place is cover all the stories that you didn't cover. You didn't cover Baylor, they won a national championship. They were the reigning national champions. And I think there were a couple of other, like I thought Northwestern had um, a great story. I think they had a player in which we didn't, we didn't cover. I, I will say the 60 minute documentary that they did on our team, it was, for, it was called For the Culture, happened during a time when we were starving for just basketball. So it, it helped, it, it was a recruiting tool for us. But we missed out on so many great stories that particular year. Um, and still, we haven't, you know, we, we haven't gotten back to giving our game what it deserves. Now, we've, you know, a lot of top 25 teams have played uh, each other this particular year. And, and still, we don't really give it the justice that, that it deserves. But at, at, at some point, we, we got to pivot. As coaches, when things aren't going our way, we have to pivot. In that particular year, sorry, going back to 2020, the you know the you know the the storyline of of that particular year was Sabrina Onescu, which great player, like mm -hmm. super great player. Oregon was a was a great team, but they ended up losing during a pivotal time of the season, and that's when we were able to get the number one ranking. And then there was nothing. And they continued on with the narrative of Sabrina in Oregon. And I'm just like, you know, at some point you don't want to ruffle the feathers and change up the, the focus because I wanted to focus on our team and to fight that fight in the middle of the season is it's hard, but we, we tried to do it. And then again, the bottom fell out. So I, I think what you're saying and what you're doing and you did it you did it during your career you're doing it now which i think is is very necessary whether people agree with it or not i i, I really do appreciate you stepping up and, and saying what you're saying let, let me ask you this do you think there are other programs or coaches with too much influence right now within our women's basketball community i really don't no i i don't i, I think gino has the most influence out of everyone but I also think you're absolutely right. A lot of times as women, we just, we just take what we get, right? We're just like, oh, we're just going to go along and watch and this is wrong, but I'm not going to say anything. And that, I think we need to speak out more. I think all of our coaches, it doesn't just have to be the ones at the top. Everybody needs, you see what happened in the NCAA tournament? Like we're just taking it. And now we're like, we're not taking it anymore. And I think it's time we speak up because I think it's a lot like sexism where 
people don't even realize it. Like they don't even know what they're doing is being biased towards one team. And when you point it out, they're like, oh, uh, uh, I I don't see it that way. You know, it was just, this is why we did it. But, um, you know, all of the focus, if you're going to put it on the best team, then put it on South Carolina. Let's, let's talk about Stanford winning last year. Let's not keep having the poll come out and say, the headline is UConn drops to six. UConn drops to nine. UConn drops to 11. Like, that's not the focus. Let's talk about the positives. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so UConn and, and Tennessee both dominated college basketball for an extended period of time. But in the last four tournaments, we've had four different champions. The lack of parity in women's basketball used to be a major story five years ago. How would you describe the state of the game today in terms of uh, competitiveness and parity? I think this is the most parity I've ever seen. Uh, we've, we've had parity from like, you know, number four through number 40, but we've never had it completely. There's always been some teams at the top. And even though you're undefeated, like there was a great game against Stanford. There's, there's a lot of really good games. So I think parity has finally come. And I think the reason is recruiting. I think that if the best player in the country goes to Connecticut every year, They're going to continue to be good. But when Asia Wilson went to South Carolina, you win a national championship. Lauren Cox went to Baylor. They won. Um, Arike and and Brianna Turner go to Notre Dame and we win. So really, it's the players at the top. Those really those top three or four. They're the ones that can really influence. Because if you look at the the best players, people say, oh, we have all Americans. But a lot of times those kids aren't even playing. They're not they're not ready as freshmen. And Mm -hmm. so but. You know, the ones at the very top, they're the ones that have a chance to really make a difference. And when these kids would start going other places and how are they going to go other places when they turn on the TV and all they hear about is one team? And so in their minds, they're like, oh, I I need to go to Connecticut because they're the best. And so I think if there was more parity in how we present it, I think kids would choose to go to other places. And I mean, you had the number one class this past year, so you're doing it. (laughs) We do that, and 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 you you said something that uh probably hit more home here at South Carolina with our our number one recruiting class, and is and it is um, some of the younger players aren't aren't ready yet. No. Um, our class, and, and um, it's unfortunate too when we've played the type of schedule that we've played, we we really didn't afford them to get acclimated. We we dove in and we played some top teams in the country, a lot of them, and um, it's hard. You know, it's hard to break into the, the core of our players, but, you know, we've been we've been very fortunate to attract some of the best talent in the country and um, and they wanted to do something different. And, and I'm, I'm happy they decided to come to South Carolina to do something different. Yes. And, you know, kids today, they, they want instant gratification. They're not willing to wait. I've got kids in the WNBA who didn't start until they were juniors. You know, they, they waited. They put in the time. They played behind good players. They learned a lot. And they, and they ended up having a great career. But uh, kids today, are, and really it's the parents. I think the kids are, are pretty happy. And they, they understand. Like, they know their role. They see what's happening at practice. They know they're playing behind some <laughs> veteran players. And I, I think that, you know, it's the parents. Yep, yep. So in, in 2019, you made headlines during the tournament talking about the importance of having female coaches saying that you wouldn't hire another male assistant while also calling for more female leadership. People talk about the idea of gender equity all the time, but you were very adamant that it starts with hiring women. Can you explain why that was such a strong focus for you? Well, that's the first time we had an all female staff for the first time. I do hire men and I have, of course, in the past hired some great uh, assistant coaches that have gone on to good things. But when I hired Beth Cunningham, we suddenly had an all female staff and suddenly it was big news. Uh, We went to the final four. I was the only female head coach and the only one with an all female staff. And people kept asking about it. And it was the most successful tenure in the history of the program. But I really believe that for these young women that were coaching, they have to be able to look up and see somebody that looks like them. They have to see women in power positions, in leadership positions, because that is showing them that they can do it too. And we we have a lot of good men's coaches in our game, and I wish they would hire women on their staff and get, get more women out there. But when the job opens, we're reluctant to apply. And that is a problem that we have as women. Men are, they're going to pick up the phone and call, say, Hey, I want the job. I'll I'll be great. Um, But women, we lack that confidence sometimes. And so if we can empower our team, our players and get them 
to have that level of confidence and continue to support women. You know, like what you did with, with all the female black coaches across the country when you shared the net with them. You know, we, we need to do things like that where we can help. We can mentor them. We can support them. Uh, we can kind of promote them when jobs open. And that's that's what we need to do more. But we need more women in charge. Speaking of women in charge, do you think having more women in charge might have helped avoid the weight room fiasco in last year's NCAA tournament? Oh, absolutely. I, I think, first of all, the NCA it's problematic because nobody is in charge of looking at the men's and women's tournament and saying, hey, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. I mean, they didn't even notice. And that's what I'm talking about. Same thing with, with what we were talking about earlier with the bias. They didn't even know. They didn't look. They didn't care. And so we had to speak out. And since we started to speak out, things are starting to change. So you have to have those uncomfortable conversations. If we want to change our game, if we want to grow our game, we have to point out the inequities in everything across the board. Now, would, would you feel differently if there were more female coaches in men's basketball? You know, I'm, I'm not as big on whether men uh, were in the men's game. Uh, you know, I mm -hmm. think we could be. Uh, I, I think that we certainly there are in the NBA. I mean, they're doing a great job as assistant coaches. It, it could happen at all levels. I'd love to see it happen at the young levels. When, when your son and daughter goes out to play soccer, it's always somebody's dad coaching the team. You know, they play basketball. It's always somebody's dad coaching the team. And I think they start – the, this whole socialization of going, oh, men are in charge, men are in charge. And maybe if women started earlier, um, but I really, I, I just want women to coach women. I mean, I, I want them to succeed. And why do people look at it as if going to the WNBA is a step down? You know, that, that should be, that's our game. That should be mm -hmm. the pinnacle of our games. Uh, I would love to see a lot of those assistants in the NBA come over and be head coaches on the women's side. Okay, cool. I have a clip from Flame Bears, a great podcast that spotlights female athletes that I love to share with my listeners because Danusha is a living example of the power of positivity. Danusha Francis is Jamaica's second ever Olympic gymnast. Danusha has missed the last two Olympics by literally one spot each. So she knows a thing or two about resilience and she wants to pass it on. Danusha grew up in Great Britain, is half Polish and half Jamaican. So it's easy to be curious about how she identifies herself. Definitely just like mixed race. I don't feel like I have to say I'm one or the other because I am all of them. I've just always had a very strong sense of self with sort of loving my skin color, loving my hair. And um, I'm very grateful for that because I know that that's just like an innate thing that is part of me. I've got the Polish name which is Danusha, but I've also got curly hair and brown skin and I'm very proud to be Polish and Jamaican and British. My mum is Polish and her parents, they both were refugees in World War II and my great grandma was in Auschwitz and so they've got really, obviously, really obviously great, great history. history and my great grandma had to travel across Europe to then be reunited with my granddad and then brought him to England. And then my dad's side is Jamaican so I don't have a good relationship with my dad, which has been really cool for me though, competing for Jamaica and actually getting to learn a lot more about the culture and really getting in touch with my Jamaican side. And that was also how I got in touch with some of my other family members on my dad's side. Listen to Danusha's full episode on Flame Bearers to learn more about what it means to her to represent Jamaica and the power of positive manifestation. We're gonna to switch topics a little bit. You you played pro for a season in a WBL before starting your coaching career. Did you ever think you would be a pro basketball player? No, what a dream come true. I mean, I was playing a league with Annie Myers and Carol Blazjowski. I mean, all of the greats in our game. And I remember we, we played in California for the California Dreams, sitting out there just thinking, oh my gosh, I'm playing basketball and I'm getting paid. Of course, we, we didn't get paid every week. And, uh, we, you know, I made $11,000 was my contract. And I thought I was just living the dream. Uh, I mean, it was phenomenal. And, you know, you, you have to start out with that 
to get to where we are now with the WNBA. And isn't Kathy Engelbert changing things? I mean, she's doing a fantastic job at the head of our game. She sure is. You know, you, Annie, Blaze. Well, talk about the level of play um, in, a, in a WBL when you, when you were playing uh, professionally. Well, there were so many great players, but you didn't really hear about them because you didn't you didn't know about them unless you played them, unless you were a team that was, you know, in the NCAA tournament back then. And actually it was AIAW tournament. So you take the top 16 somewhere. So you get to see some of the good players. But to just be able to be on the court with so many of them, you'd hear about them, players on the West Coast. We never heard about them. You know, you're playing them for the first time and you're saying, wow, there's a lot of great women's players out here. Mm -hmm. You get to experience the WNBA in this 26th season. You got a, a Notre Dame grad, you got Jewel Lord, you got Jackie Young, you got Enrique, you got Kayla McBride, you got Skyler. Um, you got all these players in the WNBA. Do you, do you find it difficult to cheer for any one of them or you just you just cheering for when they're out there playing? Like when they're going head to head. Um, I cheer, yeah, I cheer for individuals, <laughs> not teams. You know? right. <laughs> so uh, it's great here because we can go to Chicago or Indy and we get to see a lot of great games. And so I have a player in Indy, Lindsay Allen. So when people come in to play her, I'm just like cheering for Lindsay. And then I'm cheering <laughs> for K-Mac or Skylar or whoever else is, is out there. But yeah, I, I just cheer for individuals. I mean, what do you hope to see in the future from the WNBA? I'd love to see them increase the salaries so that these women don't have to go overseas. It's such a lonely life. I, I don't know if you played over there, but it, it just, it just is so hard. You're away from your family. It, it disrupts your life and they have to do it to make money. And so if we could get to a point where the WNBA was a job they could, that could support them throughout. And, and then, you know, you retire and I don't know what you get when you retire, but <laughs> you're, you're unpaid that much when you're there. So it's not like you can retire at 30 and be set for life. I mean, you got to find another career. So more money, bigger salaries. Our future WNBA players can, cannot go overseas and, uh, and put their bodies through so much. They, they have to put their bodies through so much. I, I did go overseas and play for like uh, three years. Um, and... I can honestly say it, it really wasn't for me. And I probably went over during a time in which we didn't have the internet. We didn't have FaceTime. We, we had landlines oh, <laughs> and, my, <wow. laughs> and my phone bill was like two, $2,000 a month. And I wasn't even getting paid that much, but I needed the taste of home. <laughs> so let's talk about your future from, from coaching. Um, you transitioned to working in front of the camera um, and also teaching at Notre Dame. Are, are you 100% sure you aren't going to want to get back into to the game on the sidelines? Oh, absolutely not. I mean, I see what you're going through. <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, between this NIL and the transfer portal and honestly, this generation is a little bit different too, but I, I lived my dream for 40 years and I am very happy to be on the sideline cheering Nia Ivy on, who's doing a <laughs> fabulous job. She's doing um, great. And I She's love great. teaching. I'm teaching a sports leadership class and it's, it's so much fun. It's all coaching. It's everything we learned in coaching. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. You've also spoken about becoming more of a, of an activist and you volunteered as a poll worker in South Bend. Is politics in your future? Absolutely not. I was actually <laughs> asked about that. Do I want to run for office here in Indiana? And uh, I, I don't. I, I, I get frustrated when I turn on anything political. And I, I just can't see why we can't talk more, have a little honest discourse, um, have an exchange of ideas. It's okay to agree to disagree, but let's talk about it. Let's talk about And our country's in such a bad place right now. We, we're just completely isolated on either end. Uh, and and I, I don't have a lot of hope for the future, but I, I want to do whatever I can. But boy, it's it's an uphill battle. Yeah. But on a lighter note, um, and we're we're going to wind down. We, we can't end this this podcast and this conversation without having a little bit of fun. OK, so so we're going to put 20 seconds on the clock and as best you can answer these questions. Okay. Best Final Four city? Columbus. Columbus. You thought Columbus was? Because we won. Okay. <laughs> you know, and I was, I, was, I was a spectator in Columbus, but I just remembered it being cold. Yeah, it was. And the sun never came out. Like the it sun never appeared. <laughs> 
there. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll let everybody else know that it's a whole lot more fun when you're participating in the final four than being there as a spectator. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Where should the WNBA add a, add a team? Philadelphia. What do you think, Don? Ooh, there's Philly. Your, there's your future coaching gig. You think Philly's a, a great place for WNBA city? You know, I, I, I think Philly's a great sports town. I don't think they could play where the Sixers are playing. I think they'd have to play somewhere smaller. Um, and I know they're talking about some other cities, maybe Denver and, uh, and another city. I, I just read, I can't remember where it was, but yeah, I, I think Philly would be great. Let's go Philly. It's time to make the move. Um, so if you weren't a basketball coach, what profession would you have gone into? I would be in social work. I was a, uh, I was a sociology major, criminal justice major, and uh, I think I, I would have been some kind of activist in the community for women. Okay. Okay. What music do you listen to when you want to relax? Uh, I listen to Yoruma. It's a piano, uh, a lot of piano, a lot of soft stuff. And I listen to Pink when I want to get excited. Okay. Okay. Pink. <laughs> <laughs> um, she had a good, um, a good uh, documentary on uh, Netflix. Yeah, I gotta, really I gotta watch that. I haven't seen that yeah. yet. Yep, I heard it was great. I didn't, I didn't watch it either, but I got, I gotta watch it as well. Um, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Oh wow, um, I would, I would love to uh, solve the problems that our country is in right now. I would love to be the mediator who can bring people to the table and get something done. That that sounds like. That sounds like the president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> we need a woman in the Oval right, Office. Right. <laughs> Let's go Kamala. <Kamala's. laughs> Lastly, better pizza, deep dish or thin crust? Well, thin crust opposed to deep dish. I don't like deep dish, but, okay. you know, I think just regular crust is really good. You know, we got some good pizza in Philly, but I got to go with the cheesesteaks. I got to ask you what your favorite cheesesteak place is. My, my favorite cheesesteak place now don't tell anybody this. I haven't eaten meat in like 14 years. Wow. Ever since I moved here to South Carolina, um, one of our assistant coaches decided to lose some weight and she said, I'm going to give up meat. And I said, okay, well, I'll do it with you. Wow. And I, and I never returned to the meat. Good for you. But when I did eat meat, uh, my favorite, you probably know this place too. Larry's, you Absolutely. know Larry's, right? Yes, Larry's. Yes. Home Larry's. Of the filler. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Larry's. Now, now, if I wasn't on that side of town, you know about Ishka Bibbles? No. Ishka Bibbles is on South Street. Okay. And South Street has Ishka Bibbles and Jim Steaks. I'm, I'm, I'm not the commercial, you know, the Pats. Oh no, um, no. Yeah, I'm not. Well, first of all, just the names, right? I'm like, yeah, right. Virginia, well, <laughs> yeah, right. I gotta go to Pat's. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on this podcast, I'm talking leadership, disruptors, change makers, it's hoops, it's politics, it's pop culture, it's the net sum of life. So before I let you go, I ask all my guests for some words of, of wisdom that either they receive that helps guide them or they want to pass along to others. So Muffet, what words of wisdom do you have to share? I, I think for women, it's believe in yourself and do what you think is right. Don't worry about what people think. We worry too much about what people think. And you know what? You're going to be criticized either way. So you might as well do what you think is best. <laughs> have the confidence to go for that job. If you want the job, go for it. Failure is a part of growth and it's okay to fail. So go for it. Very cool. Very cool. Thanks, coach. Appreciate you coming on. Um, do you have anything that you would like to promote or plug before we end? I would just like to see more women coaches. <laughs> so I want women to start applying for jobs <laughs> everywhere. That's good. So more, more women in places of coaching, um, Wall Street. Yeah, CEOs. Um, let's get them. Yes, that, let's get them. So, uh, and I think that, you know, Kathy, Kathy being hired at the WNBA is, a, you know, a, an example of, of what moving the needle. She's doing a great job at um, expanding. And I know the players 
um, on each and every team welcomes the change that she's instilled into the league. And, you know, and I think the WNBA is here to stay because of uh, what she's uh, poured into it. So, you know, I coached her. I know. Yeah. So yeah, I, yeah. I know. So, so she was it, the first female CEO of Deloitte which is a big accounting firm. So she's done a lot of great things, breaking barriers, and she's doing a lot of great things now. She is. And we'll, we'll end it on that note. Thank you, Muffet, for joining me. And um, do, do come back. <laughs> <laughs> Best of luck to you. You know, I'm cheering for you guys. Thank you. Except when you play Notre Dame. Okay. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all so much for listening. Don't forget to follow NetLife with Dawn Staley on Apple Podcasts. Uh, subscribe on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. NetLife is produced by Just Women Sports. For more great sports content, go to JustWomenSports.com. Be sure to subscribe to the newsletter and YouTube channel and follow along on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And this is Dawn Staley. Signing off and look forward to uh, having some great conversations. Before you see their scores, hear their stories. On the Flame Bearers podcast, top women identifying athletes from around the world share their trials, triumphs, and full selves. With the Beijing Winter Olympics and Paralympics underway, Flame Bearers second season is live now and highlighting stories from U.S. figure skater Brady Tennell, ROC's Oksana Abdekarmanmova, and many more. Get ready for the Beijing Games and listen to Flame Bears wherever you get your podcasts.